Hello, everyone, and welcome to the extraordinary uh, Day 16 Weekend Edition of Bitwise. Um, normally, uh, we have a more, uh, I don't know, scheduled or regimented um, agenda, but for today, since it's an unscheduled weekend stream, uh, I thought, uh, although I will start by reviewing some stuff I did yesterday so that it's on record uh, for, the, for the YouTube video or whatever, um, Today is going to be a little bit more random beyond that. I plan to do some uh, some coding, but uh, I may end up doing other things that are not strictly coding. I may end up doing more uh, live Q and A as opposed to just putting it at the end or just you know making even more random digressions than usual. Um, so I think if you were following the last few streams, you probably remember that um, I was kind of planning for this weekend to basically be to have something resembling a release candidate for version zero of Bitwise, and I never clear or not Bitwise for Ion, the Ion compiler, and I never really clearly defined what uh, V0 was, but in my mind, it had basically encompassed all of the C-like features I was planning on supporting, um, a, a few quality of life features beyond that, but basically all the C-like features, um, both in the in the resolver and in the gener code generator, um, and um, and, and, you know, basically something like this, something that you can use to write real real code, uh, something that you can use to interact cleanly with existing C libraries. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, the good news is that uh, as of all the work I did yesterday, we're very, very close to that. Uh, I, I think the only major thing remaining from the C-like subset is that I still have to do some work for enum types. And I think we'll be doing that on stream today as one of the things uh, we'll be doing. Um, but other than that, most of the big uh, missing pieces were done yesterday. Of course, uh, all of that is modulo bugs. Um, there will be bugs, as always. But um, at least stuff is there and kind of works. And I have decent confidence that if there are bugs, they are kind of, you know, whack-a-mole type stuff rather than deep conceptual issues. So... Um, let me just jump in. Uh, let me just jump in and look at the list of diffs. So, like I said, there was a ton of work done yesterday. Uh, I will go over these pretty quickly. Uh, first, check in dot operator for field access will auto deref pointers to aggregates. So, and as always, because I'm just working as a solo developer, I'm not always good about splitting up commits. Um, into like sometimes the nominal subject of a diff will actually have other changes included which is a total no-no if you're on a team but because it's mostly just me checking in stuff i'm not very regimented about that but anyway um yeah you can see a sample here so you know normally if you have a uh, an aggregate like a structure or union you can do you know whatever dot x um, but now you can also do dot x uh, on a pointer to a vector not just a vector and um, this basically means you don't need something like the arrow operator in C when you're uh, when you're doing field access on a pointer to a struct or a union. Um, so this is just basic quality of life uh, stuff. There's no, I mean, you could say that the arrow notation is more explicit, but I mostly just find it annoying and uh, aesthetically, uh, especially when you have a long chain of dereferences. Uh, I mean, we have a bunch here, although I, I cleans up some of them over this weekend. But like, if you you know something like this it's kind of annoying to have to mix these two in the same chain of, of, of nested field accesses like this looks much cleaner uh, even if this thing is more explicit in terms of what's actually going on at the machine level so anyway that was implemented um, basically a one-line change actually there's some stuff even before that I should cover because sorry there's, there's even more because this was stuff I did after last stream but the same day as last stream so never mind um, Let's go all the way back. Float consts. So we had not been really properly supporting floating float constants. Um, we would parse them, and they would kind of make their way into the AST. But um, other than just kind of, uh, well, and specifically for consts. So I don't mean literals that happen to occur in an expression context. Those worked before, although you couldn't really do much with them in terms of arithmetic. But I mean specifically const declarations like, um, what's an example? Like, you know, const pi equals whatever. So that is now supported, uh, not just for literals, but for general constant expressions. Um, 
And so the way that is synthesized on the C side is it actually uses a pound define. Um, and um, pound defines have all these issues in terms of unintentional name capture and whatnot. But because uh, once we do packages uh, and namespacing through packages, we will be able to generate prefixes on the C side so that basically, un so that the scoping discipline, even though you'll have these short names on the ion side, um, the names will be sort of disambiguated with long prefixes on the C side if necessary. And so even though they're macros, um, you can have short names on the ion side, but they get expanded to longer names on the C side, like with, our, well, like with all our names, but particularly for pound defined names, it's really important because if you have a name collision for a pound define, it's not just like a normal name shadowing, right? Like even a local variable can't shadow a pound define symbol because it's going to do a macro expansion. So we kind of avoid, we can avoid a lot of that stuff by doing the simple resolution on our side and then controlling how the corresponding C names are generated. Um, anyway, so that's in, um, as a result of this, I had a test case I checked in, I think a few days ago, three days ago, which was just a little, uh, uh, vector library, 2D vector library. So maybe I'll show that. Um, and uh, this didn't use to compile. And so I got that to compile after I put in some of the more float support. Um, so this all works now. Probably this should be taken out. I think I just put this in here because I was lazy. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's not a real test suite, but uh, this compiles, uh, I will show you in fact, um so yeah it compiles and you can this is kind of a good showcase for some good quality of life stuff with uh, implicitly typed uh, compound literals right for return values here it knows that we're returning a vec2 so even though on the c side you would have to write you know you'd have to write this on the c side uh, in ion we can just do this it's inferred from the declared types and that works in the other direction too if you're calling a function and you know the function parameter has a given type it can use that to infer the compound literal type and you don't have to specify it. Um, and that also works with assignments, although there's not an example here, but like um, if you do th something like this, if you want to zero initialize it back, you can do this. Uh, it knows that because V was declared to be a VEC2, when you do this assignment, uh, the right-hand side is resolved in a context uh, of knowing the type is VEC2. So all of that stuff is in now. And, um, you know, n n nothing revolutionary, but kind of neat. And you can see here, I specify the functions from this standard library that I need. Uh, right now, because of the way I'm doing the parsing, I, you still need to have a, you know, a parsable and type checkable uh, stub implementation, but this is actually not used for the code generation. The body is actually ignored. The only thing that really matters as far as the rest of the code is concerned is that the prototype is correct. So the, uh, the argument types and the return types and the name have to be correct. Um, so anyway, that we got that working. Um, oh yeah, so support bool type. So the C bool type, um, which in case people don't know is actually, um, for legacy reasons, if you look at the bool type, do we have standard bool defined anywhere? Um, the C bool type, unlike the C++ bool type, um, has a weird name under the hood. Um, oh, I guess it's, let me see here. Um, in C, the actual, I guess we can't use F12 for that. In C, the actual bool type, like from the language's perspective is called underscore capital B bool, which is very ugly. So if you use standard bool.h, it really just gives you these defines and false and true are not strongly typed. They're just integer constants. Um, but bool is a distinct type from integer. But anyway, so we have the same kind of thing, uh, except that we d we don't have this underscore capital B bool as the official name for that type. It's just lowercase bool like in C++. So yeah, we put that into, um, and, and it has all the correct ranking uh, in the type conversion lattice uh, as, as uh, C requires. So you can see if you look at the type rank, bool has the lowest rank, which is what C dictates. Um, so that is in... Okay, let's go to the other stuff, um, right? It turns out uh, I don't need this because I was assuming C allowed something that is technically you could support in the compiler, but it turns out it doesn't. And so I just removed this. 
Um, this thing was pretty interesting. So, you know, in C, if you're writing like, um, in C, if you have a function um, that returns, you know, you, you, you have a return type, it's not a void return. Uh, if you don't specify a return statement, it's going to say not all paths return values or something like that. Yeah, f must return a value. So I can obviously shut that up by returning a value. But suppose I do something like this, um, you know, just one of the paths of, of, say, a branch returns a value. Then it will say not all control paths return a value. And so uh, I can do this. And now it will shut up. Um, but note that I don't have to do this, right? Like it knows that if there is a branch uh, where all the cases are covered. So in other words, it's not just enough for there to be an if and an else if. Uh, sort of like all the, the all the possibilities have to be covered. If all of those possibilities uh, return values, then you don't need to have this kind of dummy return after it. Uh, if you if you had to write this, this would be really obnoxious. Um, and so uh, I implemented that kind of thing in the compiler. Um, it was a relatively minor change. In fact, the initial implementation for this check-in handled something that I realized later is not n neither quite legal, especially now that we don't have go-tos. Uh, but anyway, um, it, it wasn't sufficient for what I was trying to do. And also I realized that given the current language, it's actually not necessary. So let me show you what we actually do to do this control flow analysis for the returns. It's very simple. Um, so we have this top level function called resolve statement. If you go back and look at the earlier version, it just returned void. It didn't really produce a result. It was just responsible for validating that everything uh, type checked and so on. Um, but now it returns a bool. And the bool is basically saying, does this statement and any sub-statements, if there's a block or a while loop or whatever, if, sta if statement or a switch statement, do all paths of this statement return a value, yes or no? Um, and so you can see here, the case analysis is quite simple. For all these primitive statements, it's like, yes, a return statement certainly returns a value. Um, a break statement doesn't. Um, a block statement returns a value if the block as a whole returns a value. So we'll look at that function in a sec. For an if, the rule is basically that um, we have to look at all the branches. So we have this bool returns, which starts out being just, you know, does the if, does the does the positive branch return a value? And then it checks if all the other branches return values as well. And then the if statement as a whole always returns a value if all the branches always return value and all the branches are covered. So um, actually, this should be written. Um, well, yeah, let me just write it like this. So you can see that this is just taking the and of everything, basically. Um, but in the case where there's no else clause, there's only else ifs but no else. Uh, it doesn't return a value because it's possible it could hit the else case. So that's sort of the logic here. For most of these things, it's quite straightforward. Switch is pretty much like if in the sense that all the branches have to return values and there has to be a default clause. Um, because if there isn't a default clause, it's like an if statement that lacks an else, right? It's possible you could fall through to that. Um, so anyway, that's the basic logic here. And then for um, for block statements, it's really just saying if any of the statements, the sequential statements in the block return a value, then this thing as a whole returns a value. So this means that, um, and this is true in C as well, if you uh, if you do something like this, it, you know, it's totally fine to do this. This is still considered as always returning a value, uh, and we support that too. So it's not, it, it doesn't just check whether the last thing in the block returns. It checks when, whether any of the things in the block returns. Because if any of them re returns, then you know at least one of them returns. That's sufficient. It's not doesn't have to be the last one. So that was really the only thing we needed for that. That turned out to be simpler than expected, uh, and it seems to handle all the cases I could come up with. Uh, once we add go tos, uh, that will need to be modified. We will need to know exactly what the 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 furthest uh, uh, the furthest out you can escape um, from the go to, and anything that's sort of potentially in the scope of a go to. Uh, has to be considered suspect, basically. Um, but uh, for now, this is seems to be sufficient for the language we have. Um, I think that was basically it. Uh, right, dot operator for auto deref. I mentioned that um, it will. You will now get errors. This was. I mean, this was just a small thing. But like, if you if you reuse names, like suppose I say like const f is 42, uh, I'm now going to get a, a global. A duplicate definition of global symbol and similarly for local symbols if i try to like redefine this 
um, I will get a local symbols shadow definition of local symbol. And in fact, the way I do it right now, um, this is true uh, even if the thing is under a different scope like this. So this will uh, also produce a shadow definition error. But interestingly, this will not, right? Um, this will not be considered a shadow definition because, I mean, it's not shadowed. Um, so anyway, that is implemented. And that was a very simple check for both of those cases. Um, yeah, we basically just, I mean, when we, when we put a new uh, global symbol in the symbol table, we just check whether there's already an entry. And for simpushvar, which does the push onto the local variable stack, um, it just checks whether there's already one there, right? Like, so it's it's about as simple as it could be. It was just a matter of hooking it up. Uh, another nice thing is that um, you now have a more function call style notation like C++ for type conversions. So um, here you can use this kind of notation or, well, these are compound literals, so they're slightly different, but this, is, this acts as a conversion. Um, and so previously, you, you could have written something like this, right? For, for typecasts, this would mean the same thing. Uh, oh, this is a semicolon. Um, but you can use this notation here, which is quite a bit nicer. Um, that works. And note that unlike, uh, th this is not the same as this. Like, I mean, in this case, it wouldn't matter. You could write this as well. Um, but the difference is that compound literals like this with the curly braces are actually L values, just like in C, whereas doing the, the conversion with the round braces is gives you an R value. Um, so that was in uh, explicitly sized types, pretty much what you expect. Um, again, right now, these are these kind of make assumptions about the sizes of these that need to be factored out into some more backend, uh, into some backend specific data but this is pretty much universal, so this is not too bad. Um, and yeah, typed ups for those guys, for those explicitly sized types. Um, support for C style non-pointer constants. So one thing I did this weekend was just basically supporting all the C style stuff, even the things that some people may, myself included, may have opinions about uh, in terms of whether it's a great idea or not. But anyway, um, you can now, you know, in C, the, the literal zero or the constant expression zero of uh, of any integer type uh, can be used as a null pointer. And so, for example, uh, you can do something like this. You can say arc v, which is a pointer to a pointer. You can say arc, arc v equals zero. This will, zero will be considered a null pointer in this context. You can't do, for example, one, right? Uh, that will be like an invalid conversion. Um, but you can't do zero, just like C. Uh, and similarly, like down here, you can, you, well, you can assign zero um, or you can assign null. Um, and that works exactly like C, or it's supposed to. If it doesn't, that's a bug. Uh, and to go along with that, there's also now a, uh, what is it? Uh, sim global const. There's a null constant. And just like C, uh, the null constant has void pointer type. Um, but numerically, it's just it's just a, a zero. Um, but you know, we, we don't do it with a macro. This is just considered a global constant, just like these guys. So even though these generate C code uh, on the sort of on the C side, uh, for us, these are not actually macros. These are true constants, but they behave similarly. So they should behave as expected if you're coming from C. Um, right, this is the thing I just mentioned. Um, uh, one small thing which I had been meaning to do is, um, uh, let's see here. Previously, when you were declaring, oh, typed F, sorry, typed F, F, wait, typed F, oh, here. Previously, when you were declaring uh, function types, like these are function pointer types, um, you would do something like this. Uh, you would only specify the the type spec in the uh, parameter list. Now you can specify optional names just to have them mirror the uh, the function declarations. In function declarations, the names are op uh, mandatory. Here they're optional. Um, they don't, right now they don't, because we don't have like name 
name uh, we don't have like named arguments function arguments when you're calling or whatever they don't actually matter um they're just really there um so that if you want to be more document if you want to document it basically what each parameter means you can now do that in that style so that's basically like c as well um oh right so th this is by far the biggest change i did yesterday uh, and this is not the final check-in for this, but basically I added uh, the const qualifier. So previously we didn't have, and we'll need to add volatile eventually, but it'll mostly be the same as const because the way const and volatile work in C is sort of intended to be uh, very similar in terms of you know when you can drop it and when it's required and things like that. But anyway, previously we didn't have a notion of const qualification. We had a notion of const declaration, which is a different thing. A const declaration declares an actual mathematical constant but uh, a const qualifier is like in C, right? It qualifies a type that has a fairly intricate meaning that may or may not line up with what people expect when they hear the word constant. But anyway, if you're a C programmer, you do know what it means. Um, syntactically, it's a just like all the other kinds of type constructor things we do, it's a postfix notation. So char is the base type, then you write const, you now have a const qualified character type. And then you do the star, and now you have a pointer to a const qualified character type. Uh, incidentally, in case you didn't know, this re this is you know most people in C would write this as something like this, right, in that order. But there are, but it's actually legal to write it in that order, uh, the, in this order in, in C, in case you didn't know. So um, you can either do this, um, and you know you can write like this, of course. Um, but you can also write, in case you didn't know, you can also write this. This actually means the same thing. Uh, and some people are actually like this. I mean, you can make a strong argument that if you came to see, if you came to see without any previous knowledge of C syntax for this stuff, that this notation is actually more descriptive because this here makes it maybe sound like the thing that's constant is the pointer, whereas this thing here, if you read it in a kind of postfix way, it kind of makes it clear that the thing that's being const qualified is the char part, not the pointer part. But anyway, um, so we have that postfix notation, uh, which is consistent with C, but C allows the other order as well. Um, so that's the parsing part. Now, in terms of how it works in the type system, um, first we just have, uh, just like we have all these different type kinds. Oh, and I moved all the type stuff to a separate file because it was becoming kind of out of place. Um, we have all these type kinds for the built-in primitive types, and then we have these uh, type kinds for all these kinds of constructor-derived things, like a, you know, a pointer to another thing, a function pointer built from other types, arrays, structs, unions, enum consts, and we also have const. Where's const? Did I miss that? Oh, it's the very last one in the list. Um, so yeah, so const, and in, in, in the, the way I chose to represent it, rather than making const like a flag in here or something like that, it's just a, um, it's another thing like a pointer, right? Like you, you have a function called type const and it is literally, the code is basically the same as type uh, putter. So it has the same sort of interning approach with this cache uh, this hash map for the cache and, and all this other stuff. Um, the only difference is, and we could make this an error rather than just doing the idempotent thing, but uh, it's set up to be idempotent like in C, which we could just warn against if we wanted to, but you can write something like this. And um, it means the same thing as a single const because it's idempotent, because it's like a qualifier. It's not like, you know, having a, a pointer to a pointer to an end is not the same as a single pointer to an end. So that's kind of a difference from the way, say, pointers work. Um, but uh, the way the code works for the interning is basically um, there's this check to deal with the idempotence. So we don't try to cache the idempotence check, right? Like uh, this is an easy way of handling it here. Um, but then if, if that is not true, then we consult the cache. And if the cache doesn't have a hit, then we fill in the first entry, same as we do for these other cases. You can see the main difference here is that we set this non-modifiable flag to true, um, which is has the default value for all the other cases, uh, which is false. The default is false for that flag. Um, the non-modifiable flag is used to deal with the fact that in C, if you have a... There's a there's a transitive notion of non-modifiability. So, uh, and I can even I can demonstrate it in Ion because we actually support it properly. Um, 
suppose I have uh, like the a first struct, um, and maybe one field is int and the other is a is a const qualified thing, uh, and then we have another thing here, uh, and this thing here has a uh, an instance of this other struct, uh, and the other instance here is not const qualified, so it doesn't say you know s1, it doesn't say s1 const, like that's not what it says, it just says s1. But by virtue of S1 having a field that's const qualified, S1 gets becomes non-modifiable. You can't assign to S as a whole. You can assign to the A field, but you can't assign to the struct as a whole, right? Like you can't do S1 equals whatever, right? Uh, to, to totally overwrite the value because one part of it is non-modifiable. And so we need this notion of non-modifiability, which is transitive. If any part recursively has a non-modifiable part, then you are also non-modifiable. So in this case here, um, um, if I do something like this, um, oh yeah, and I have a new notation for um, for this stuff. So let me show that as well. Um, if I have this, I can of course I can do this. Well, first let me just show that this hopefully works. All right. So that type checks and compiles. Uh, I can do this, of course, to assign to the non-const field. Um, it won't let me do this, right? It has non-modifiable type. Um, if I have, oh, and, and also it won't let me do this. So suppose I try to just assign to the thing as a whole, it won't allow that either because, um, because the non-modifiability is inherited from the field. Um, and that is also true um, for something that contains the struct, right? Like, so it's true recursively all the way. So for example, here you can do, you know, oops, you can do this. That's great. Um, you, you can't do this. Um, so this is illegal. Uh, you can't do this. I'm just going to go through the cases of what you can and can't do just to make it very clear. You can't do this. Uh, and you, and you can't do this because again, the non-modifiability is inherited. Um, so, um, that's what the non-modifiable flag is for. So for, for everything it's, it's false by default. But for const qualified types, those things are non-modifiable. And then um, basically other things kind of inherit, like I said, the non-modifiability. So if you have an array of non-modifiable things, then you are also non-modifiable. So if you have an array of con int consts, you know, constant qualified integers, this is like a read-only table in a sense, right? Like you can't modify the entries. Um, doesn't matter for this. For structs and unions is really the big one. Um, because here we basically just say, if any of the fields are non-modifiable, then we are non-modifiable. Same for unions. Um, so that's the logic behind, uh, the non-modifiable flag and, and the way it works in order to work like C. Um, that was actually the easy part. The non-modifiability stuff is by far the easy part about everything related to cons. The stuff that's much more complicated has to do with when things can be converted, um, um, you know, for example, uh, let me try to write out some cases here. If you have, you know, if you have an int, you, you, you can do const int to say int, right? Like you can, you can always, well, if, if, if our, if, um, if, if something like this is true, you know, let's say this, uh, int const, um, you can do this, oops, you can do this, um, because I is not const qualified. So first off, it's modifiable. The right-hand side has a constant type, but because it's being used in an R value context, we basically drop the constness. So one of the things that took me a little bit to realize, uh, even though the standard, the C standard kind of says it, but it's awkwardly phrased and it's not really where you'd expect it in terms of uh, where it occurs in the standard. But um, the notion of constness only really makes sense for things that are L values. 
uh, like once you're dealing with a specific thing. I'm not talking about, you know, like a sub part of something, but um, if you have an int const L value, for example, and that L value is used in an R value context like this assignment, you need to basically drop the constness because at that point it's like, well, it's no longer an L value. So the constness is really uh, a misnomer, right? Like at that point uh, it can be used in any context where an int R value is expected. So that's the sort of thing you have to handle. And it gets even more complicated um, because, uh, and this is the stuff I was working on last night um, before I went to bed, is that um, it interacts with pointer conversions, right? So for example, if you have um, if you have one pointer which is uh, int const star and then another one which is int const, then you're allowed to do uh, p equals q because uh, you know these are pointers. The thing they point to are not the same, but in some sense, the left hand side is stricter than the or how to put it. Um, the set of qualifiers for the right-hand side is stricter than the left-hand side set of qualifiers for the base type of the pointer type, that sort of thing. Uh, and this also needs to work when you have void stars in the mix. So for example, even if the types, you know, if, if this was float, this would not be legal, but if it was void, then it would be legal. Uh, and of course, with both of these cases, the reverse would definitely not be true. Um, if Q is a, a pointer to a constant integer, then you can't assign it to this because P lets you assign through it. Uh, and this does not, I mean, that's the intention. Um, anyway, uh, so I had to deal with all that stuff. I'm not gonna go over the detailed code for that, um, but I'm going to mention a few, um, I mentioned the, the for, for me, the minor conceptual breakthrough in terms of organizing the code, not just for the const stripping for our values, but also for a pointer, uh, a rate of pointer decay, was realizing that really this has to do when an expression is being used in an R value context. So I, um, I had some really ugly names for this stuff when I was working on them. And then I realized that, wait, this is actually resolving an expression in R value. I renamed it to what it, what it is now. And suddenly everything became very clear and I found a bunch of bugs as a result as well. But anyway, so now you have this um, variant of the resolve expression function, which you know specifies that basically you're resolving it in the context that expects an R value. And so what it does is beyond just resolving it, it also calls this function operand decay. And operand decay does two things, uh, three, I guess. Um, the first thing is it unqualifies the type. So if you have uh, an int const, it unqualifying it means it just strips the, uh, it strips the uh, const part, otherwise leaves it alone. So that's not number one. Number two is pointer decay. If you have an array type, it decays it to, uh, you know, a pointer to the base type. So if you have an array of ints, it gives you a pointer to an int. Um, and if you think about where pointer decay is necessary, this is pretty much exactly it. Um, when you're using an array on the right-hand side of something, like, I mean, our value is not technically just on the right-hand side, but you get what I mean. Like this is kind of the context where you can do pointer decay. Uh, and so this kind of is a single location that can do multiple kinds of sort of unqualification or type decay where it, it, it strips certain features of an operand's uh, characteristics, like the, the, the type qualifiers, does the array to pointer conversion, does the R, potential uh, L value to R value uh, decay as well. Uh, and actually doing it this way, what found me the bugs when I made this discovery that it was all about the L value to R value uh, conversion is that when I set this, it, previously I had this function, but I didn't have this line. And so I basically, just to be sort of affirmative, I just decided, okay, let's actually throw away, explicitly throw away the L value-ness. And that then triggered a bunch of bugs where I was using the wrong function um, anyway. So that was kind of a nice... Uh, discovery, but but basically what that meant now is that um, pretty much anywhere where you're doing recursive uh, expression resolution, the thing you end up calling is actually the R value function. So if you're doing binary operations, you call resolve expression R value, and so that's going to deconst qualify stuff if it's const qualified, uh, and it's going to also do pointer decay. So for example, if you're doing pointer arithmetic. Uh, either left or right could be an array. And so this will also do pointer decay so that they will now have pointer type rather than array type, which means that by the time you're doing 
I mean, for example, pointer arithmetic down here, or I guess add as well, right? Like add or sub is where you do pointer arithmetic. Um, these have already been converted to pointer types from array types. And so you don't have to do more, you don't have to do more case analysis down here. It can just deal with pointer types. So that was a very nice conceptual simplification. Um, and a lot of this stuff ended up handling like 90% of the issues with uh, const qualified operands. Um, not all of it though. I, one, one specific case where the code is still not as clean as I would want, but I'll just show it is um, I have this function is convertible. Uh, and is convertible is used anytime you're doing um, implicit conversions. So anytime you're, you know, passing an argument or assigning an R value to an L value or whatever, uh, it tries to do this implicit conversion. And so you call it with the operand you're trying to convert and the destination type. Um, and um, this is always used for um, only for R values. Because, you know, for example, int is convertible to char, but an int pointer or like an int L value is not convertible to a char L value because those are like locate, those designate locations in memory or registers or whatever. And uh, that those are actually more like pointers, just like you can't implicitly convert, convert an int star to a char star. You can't convert an int L value to an R, uh, to a char L, uh, L value. So the result of a conversion is always an R value. But anyway, this is convertible function is responsible for doing these checks. Uh, like I said, it's more complicated, especially this part down here. And I, I actually already know some things I want to simplify about it. But anyway, you can convert implicitly between any two arithmetic types. Um, you can convert between, uh, you can convert from a null pointer, which um, this is the thing I mentioned, um, is basically any integer, actually any arithmetic thing. Uh, I wonder if that's right. Can you actually, <laughs> I don't think that's right. I don't think you can do this, right? Because that's what this code allows right now. No, you can't do that. So this should be integer type. Because you only want to allow this. Okay. Um, Right, so if you have a constant and the constant is either a pointer type or an integer type, then if and only if the actual constant value is zero, this thing is a null pointer. Um, and so, uh, and, and the, by the way, all of this stuff is more or less directly out of the C standard, um, just kind of reorganized, but it, it, this stuff was all kind of cribbed or uh, based on my reading of the C standard. So, you know, you can convert from a uh, from any kind of null pointer, even if it's not a pointer type, even if it's just an integer, naked integer or zero, can convert to any pointer type. Um, if you have two pointer types, then here's where some of the complicated stuff with const is involved because it's basically the set of cases I was describing a second ago in terms of what you can and can't convert between. Um, so this is a bit of a mess, but it seems to handle uh, seems to handle correctly, even if the code is not very clean. There's a lot of redundancy, so I'm going to have to revisit that. But anyway, so that's the is convertible function. Um, that reminds me. So that yeah, that's pretty much it for const qualified types, or what I want to say. The other thing I added, which is a continuation of what I just mentioned, is uh, previously we didn't really have a distinction between casts and conversions. It was just all one function that was previously called convert operand. So the new function called convert operand is only used for implicit conversions, like where you don't have to do an explicit cast. Uh, and then there's a, now a thing called cast operand, which is basically a superset of the things you can do with convert operand. So first off, there's a thing called is castable, and is castable again is a superset of is convertible. So if two things are convertible, then definitely they're also castable. But then you can do things like you convert from any arithmetic type to any pointer type, right, and, and vice versa. Um, actually, we don't support the vice versa right now. You can also do the reverse. Okay, so that's a, that's a bug. This is why doing these reviews is good because explaining it really makes me realize when there are bugs. So I think right now, um, given what I just read, I think I should. It won't let me. Do I have a test cast? Okay, let's make one. Um, I think it won't. So implicitly, it shouldn't let me. Um, suppose I have an address 
like something like this. Um, it shouldn't let me. Um, and then I have some, I don't know, some random pointer here. Um, so it definitely shouldn't let me do this implicitly. And I'm sure it won't, right? Invalid type. But it should let me do, um, it should actually let me do this, for example. I don't think it will right now. No, it will. Okay, so where, so here I'm converting from a pointer. Oh, I see. Okay, it does handle both cases. I'm sorry. So if either, right, you can convert from arithmetic to pointer or vice versa. All right, all right. Yeah, so that is handled. But anyway, yeah, you can handle this stuff here. And you can do the other way as well, of course. So you can do, uh, you can't do this implicitly, um, but you can do it explicitly. So let me just write things. And things in comments that you cannot do implicitly. Um, all right, so yeah, distinctions between casts and conversions. This was the stuff I already talked about. Just a random bug. Some polish. Right, so here's another one. Uh, previously, the way we were handling literals is that we were parsing. Um, let me show you the code. And this is going all the way back to when we were working on the Lex. We haven't actually revisited this code in a while. If you look at, for example, the way we were parsing uh, ints, we were we were always doing like hex, octal, binary, and decimal um, parsing. However, um, we were treating them as a single unified type, which I think in my, in my case was just an int. Like it wasn't, uh, actually at one point it was a UN64 and then it was just an int. But anyway, it was just a single type. We just assumed that if there was an integral literal, it always had a specific type, which is not how C works. And it also didn't let us do, for example, 64-bit constants um, the way C lets us do and assign constants the way C let us do and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, the lecture was basically okay, but we weren't doing, uh, down, sort of downhill from this or whatever downstream from this and the more semantic part in the resolver, we weren't handling, uh, different kinds of literals correctly. So the good news is that we didn't, uh, I intentionally didn't put most of the smarts about this stuff in the lecture. And the reason is some of this stuff actually is backend dependent. So the way I ended up handling it is first off, we were, we already had these modifier flags that were stored on the token so that, um, once, once the AST or some later part in the pipeline sees a, uh, an integer literal token, it can know as whether it was part, it can not only see the final value that's been prelexed, um, but it can actually see, was it originally a hex or a whatever, a decimal or a octal or whatever. Um, so I extended that by also adding the suffix. So in addition to these uh, sort of uh, bases, there's now also a suffix. Uh, and these are just handled just like C, uh, like U for unsigned, L for long, LL for long, long. Um, and so that was really the only change that had to happen in the lecture. We had to add the suffix flag, and then we had to add this simple suffix parsing. And then there's a very similar thing, but simpler for floats. So in, in C, um, oh, and I should mention uh, the storage type here is unsigned long long. So this is wide enough to accommodate any of the things we're parsing. Uh, so unsigned long long is the storage type, but uh, we, we associate these suffixes so we can later reinterpret that data in the appropriate way. Um, for floats, we're parsing it as a double, which again is wide enough to accommodate both floats and doubles losslessly. Um, and then we, we now have a D suffix. So this is a case where I intentionally flipped C's design on its head, because in C, if you write uh, 1.3.15, uh, right, this is actually not a float, it's a double. Um, and if I now do, uh, if, I, if I have a float F and I do F plus uh, or let's call it X just so we don't get confused with the F suffix. If I write this, what it actually means is 3.15, this literal here is a double. When I add it to X, uh, X is actually promoted because of the usual arithmetic conversions. 
if one of the operand is a double, the other is, is converted to a double. So in this kind of combination, X is actually promoted to a double, and then you do the addition as a double. And if you then end up assigning it back to X, this basically truncates back to float implicitly. Um, and so as a result, if you want to avoid, I mean, in most cases, it honestly doesn't matter, but it's just uh, on some platforms, for example, where double precision floating point is slower or whatever, this is not the greatest. And so as a habit, a lot of people have gotten used to writing F on all their constants, which you have to do if you want true float rather than double constants. And in my mind, this is totally the wrong default. Um, in particular, like the fact that I, I, I don't think I've ever intentionally written a double literal in my life. Like, I mean, that's not an exaggeration. Obviously there's libraries that I've used that have double precision constants, but it's literals I read in my code are basically never intended to be doubles. Um, furthermore, even if you make floats the default, I mean, they will still get promoted to doubles when used in a double context. So it's not like you're making it harder to use these constants with doubles if you want to use them with doubles. It's really only when the constant you're representing absolutely needs to be a double manifestly. Um, and so anyway, so I, I basically just flipped the convention on its head so that now 3.14 is always interpreted to have float type. And if you want double type, you put a D suffix. So that's what we do. That's the backstory. Um, so that's it for the lecture. There's not much to it there. Uh, then the only other thing we had to do to accommodate that change is we had to add some extra fields to the AST for um, these literals that used to just be the value now we have both the token modifier and the token suffix don't need the modifier for floats but we do need the suffix for both of these um, and then where it actually ends up mattering is um, expected what is it called uh, oh this thing is case sensitive all of a sudden um, and then in, when we're doing the, the resolving, um, we'll return the syntactic information into semantic information, but well, we'll look at this function in a second. But for floats, which are the simplest case, you can see there's basically two, two cases. If we have a D suffix, then we get a double type. Otherwise, we get a float type. That's it. Uh, ints are more complicated um, because I chose to mirror C's rules, for better or worse, just to have parity. And then we, we can make them stricter or whatever later. But for now, I have C's rules for this. Um, and let me show you what C's, C's rules are. Um, boom, boom, boom. Constants. Here we go. Oh, God, this is so annoying. I don't know. I, I think it's Windows 10 occasionally gets into a state where uh, I have to... Um, I have to minimize... Okay, let me just close it and reopen it. Um, okay, here we go. Where were we? Right, integer constants. So aside from just the syntax of like, you know, the different bases and, and the suffixes, um, in terms of what the actual meaning of these things are, uh, this is what the standard specifies. And some of this may be new to some of you. Uh, in the details. And I'll try to rationalize why they do it this way. Even though it has problems, there is a method to the madness. Uh, the first thing is, if you don't have a suffix, then you have a you know a decimal integer literal. Um, then you're going to get one of these types. And, and, the, and, the, and the interpretation of this table is that depending on what combination of you know rows and columns you're in, um, you, you're going to get the smallest type that is wide enough to accommodate your literal. Okay, the smallest type that is wide enough to, in this list, earliest enough, I shouldn't say smallest because some of these things can have the same size, like int and long are probably the same size, but uh, this ranking here is really what matters. The earliest thing in the list that fits the integer literal constant gets the, is what the type of that constant is. Um, so if you have an unsuffix decimal constant, um, then you're always going to get a signed quantity. That's really the logic behind this table. If there isn't an explicit un a u suffix and you're dealing with decimal constants, you're always going to get signed quantities. Um, why is that? Well, um, 
it's because when I write minus one, two, three, this is not the literal minus one, two, three. This is uh, unary minus applied to uh, literal one, two, three. And so when you're writing decimals, if one, two, three was an unsigned type, then when you apply minus to it, you would still have an unsigned type. In fact, that's the origin of the warning that some compilers have where they say unary minus applied to an unsigned type is like a warning. In my opinion, it should warn about it being applied directly to a literal, but not to an arbitrary unsigned type. But anyway, this is the origin of this warning. And you can see this is definitely not what you want. Like if one, two, three was any kind of unsigned type, minus applied to it is going to give some large number that's you know the max value minus one, two, three plus one or something like that. It's not going to be what you expect. It's not going to be an actual negative signed number. Um, and so that's the reason why decimal constants in particular are always, unless they're explicitly U qualified, they are always signed. And then they basically are just the right type depending on how big they need to accommodate it. Um, that is not true for ox and hect, uh, octal and de hexadecimal constants. And why is that? Why couldn't they just have the same rule? Well, uh, the reason is if you do something like this, and we can do an ion, if you do something like this, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so this is all ones, 32 bits, all ones. If you write this and you use the same rules from this decimal constant, uh, non suffixed box, int can't fit this and if long int is uh, say 32 bits as well then long int can't fit it either so the smallest thing that can fit it is long long int which is actually 64 bits not 32 bits wide so that's really not what you want right like if if you have this concept of picking the smallest type or whatever earliest ranked type from a list of candidates uh, that fits then this is really not what you want most of the time i mean if you write something like this um you expect a 32-bit type, right? Like for the constant, you don't expect a 64-bit type. Uh, but by making, by having these unsigned type be candidates as well, um, you can get the right thing, which in this case is an uint. This will be a uint because it won't fit an int, but it will fit an uint. So it will stop here and say, that's good enough. So that's the logic behind why hex and oct so, so, so this is sort of the two pieces. Why decimals have to be signed in order to easily support minus one, two, three, and similar things. And conversely, why octal, octal and hexadecimal allow for things to be unsigned. Doesn't require them, but allow for them to be unsigned. Um, now, there's a totally different overall design approach to this general problem, which is what Go and Swift does, which is essentially everything is signed under the hood, and then they're converted after evaluating them at compile time to finally, like their final type based on what they want. So my, one, two, three would always be signed. In fact, zero X, you know, this would also be signed in Go because all the untyped constants are signed. Um, and then when you finally assign it to a specific context, then at that specific point, they would pick the narrowest type available. And, and this gets around a lot of these issues, but, um, I was originally planning on handling Guyon's literals in the same way, but ran into issues with interoperating with C when we're doing C code generation. We may revisit how we do this later, but for now, I just stuck with the C approach. The good news is this is actually not very hard to implement. You basically just have to implement this table. So let me show you the code for that now that you understand the rationale and, and what this is all about. And maybe you learned something new about C because when I explained this to people yesterday, a bunch of people expressed a surprise that this is actually how it works. But I think if you understand why decimals have to be signed in order to support minus one, two, three, and why you don't want these to only be signed in order to make sure that something like, you know, FF, FFFFF, et cetera, is a uint rather than long, long signed. Um, hopefully you can at least see some reason of why it is this way, even if uh, globally you have a, a different preference for something more like Go or Swift. I, I, would, I would be sympathetic, but hopefully at least understand the rationale given the constraints of C. Um, so, so what does the code actually do? Well, it's mostly quite simple. For each of the cases that essentially represent one of these boxes, it just does a check. It has a default type, and then if the value needs to be bigger to accommodate it, it just walks up the ladder until it's either done. And in some of these cases, it has to actually do an overflow check because, for example, for decimal ints, you cannot promote longer than long, long int. And so if you have, if you've parsed a u long max value, for example, that would pass through from the lexer 
but then the, that would get detected as an overflow at this stage. And this is why we defer this checking until uh, the resolver where we have some level of backend information. Uh, it should be noted though that these this is technically dirty because these values here are um, don't depend on the target. Like this value int max is coming from where I'm compiling the compiler, which is not the target system. These should really be um, Right, so uh, right. So, uh, just a small note, uh, good for me to put this comment in so I don't forget once we revisit it. And there's other cases like this right now where I'm hard coding stuff, but this one is probably the easiest to get wrong. But yeah, this, this should not really use the host system, but because the compiler and the target is the same thing right now, um, I can get away with this, but this needs to be revisited once we move to another setup. Um, all right, so that's how this works. And I mean, I, it's basically just implementing the table. There's nothing interesting from a code perspective, but I think it's interesting to understand why it works the way it does. Um, uh, range checks, yep, preserve. So yeah, so one thing we did to go along with this, uh, which is not very interesting from the code perspective, but I just want to show it to you. Uh, I want to show you the generated C code is that I take special care to generate corresponding code on the C side um, for all these different combinations of bases and suffixes so that it looks vaguely idiomatic. Now, we obviously still have major sources of non-idiomatic code, like all this over parenthesization, which is easy to remove later. But the way I'm handling con uh, the generation of integer constants right now is actually, uh, integer literals is actually idiomatic. So I do all the proper suffixes uh, I did, you know, I, I preserve the fact that this thing was specified as oct rather than some other thing, and I use the suffix it was specified with, even if it may be redundant in a specific context. So this stuff is all preserved all the way through. Um, the case where you can't preserve it is for stuff like binary literals, which aren't actually supported in C. So binary literals, um, binary literals like these here, these are two kind of bitwise complements uh, that are both uh, kind of eight bits. Um, these these things here are parsed as binary, but they are emitted on the C side as hex, which is normally how you would write them if you're a C programmer. But you can, you know, you still have, it still looks kind of idiomatic C, but you have the ability to write them as binary uh, literals over here, which is uh, nice, I think. Uh, so yeah, so all that stuff is done. The other case where we do that is for, um, uh, what you might call it, uh, for chars, so char constants. So where's that? Where's that table here? Um, in C, these kinds of char constants, these quoted things, are actually ints, um, and so they just they pass through essentially the entire system as integers. Um, and so previously they were just being emitted as actual decimal integers because that's in some sense what they are. But now that I'm preserving all these modifiers through the whole pipeline, it means that I can resynthesize them properly. And I do stuff like, you know, I generate escapes when they have to be escaped. And um, let me show you a case. Uh, if you do something non-printable and non-escapable or without an explicit escape thing, um, like suppose I made an entry here for like one. Um, then it should actually, oh, sorry, it won't preserve it. And I guess I don't have X, right? I haven't implemented X escapes, so that's not a good example. But anyway, um, if you have, oh yeah, I guess the, the case where this actually matters is in strings. So we do this kind of thing now for strings too. Suppose you have a string um, and you do, well, I guess I don't really parse it. So maybe there's not an easy way to, I, I need to actually add uh, backslash x parsing because I do backslash x emitting, but I don't do parsing right now. But I, l let me show you the code so you can see what it is I was trying to demo, but I'm having a hard time actually generating input that will do that. But basically the logic for doing all the escaping is if there is an explicit escape, then we use that. Otherwise, if it's printable, we just print it literally. Otherwise we will generate a 
backslash x um, thing. And um, this is also used in a slightly different form in string literals because in string literals, unlike here, you know, in theory, because these ultimately have type int, we could have just omitted, like we could have done something like this, right? Like that would have been totally valid. Uh, and maybe indeed I should do that, but anyway, uh, I do it this way. But inside a string, a quoted string, you actually don't have that option of emitting the decimal directly. You have to use this kind of escaped uh, backslash x for um, non-printable, non-escapable uh, characters. So that is in as well. And so, wait, what? Why didn't that? <laughs> I know for a fact I did that search and replace earlier. Bizarre. I must have undone some code accidentally there. All right, I'm not quoting this correctly. Maybe that's what was. Con Okay, anyway, back to normal C. But yeah, so all of that stuff is handled much better now on the output side. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're inching, once I do better, uh, once I do better reduction in the number of parentheses we emit and do more line breaks and big initializers like this, we're starting to have something that looks more like a dramatic C code. So we're kind of getting there, getting there inch by inch. Um, let's see here, all right. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned this in passing, but just want to make it, very clear. Um, previously, we, the only kind of local initializer statement we had was this fully type inferred thing with colon equals. So that obviously is still there. There's now also a variant of this. This is still considered the same kind of statement. It's basically a syntactic variant of the same kind of statement. So you can do this where you're declaring something without an uh, initialized value. Um, but you can also do this if you want to have a, you know, you want to have an explicit initializer, but you also want to declare the type. So sometimes you want to, you know, for example, maybe right hand side is uh, has a different type than what you want, and you want to rely on implicit conversion here. You might want to have this explicitly declared type, or just for documentation purposes, maybe you're the kind of person who likes things to be more explicit. You have the option of using this, and this works, of course. The, the main reason this is useful, as well, well, one reason this is useful is that it can be used in for clauses. So if you have like, you know, you can do this. Um, Um, but you can also do, actually, let me just remove, I, I want to fix that annoying warning. I don't like seeing that pop up. What is this thing? Does this say P is unused? Does this help it go away? Okay. Um, right, so you could do something like this, of course, but, you know, suppose for whatever reason, uh, I don't know, you, you wanted to have uh, a size, uh, like, I don't know, you wanted to have like a, an N64, you could do something like this. Oh, and it's complaining about, um, let me not say, let's do like this. Yeah, you can, you can do something like this uh, if you want to be explicit. So that works not only here, but it works in these kind of contexts. Um, note that uh, despite this notation here, which doesn't require a var, um, and the reason is var is a de declaration, but a statement, this is a statement. So that's one difference just syntactically. But when I made this change, I made I, I made an experiment where I tried to remove all of these guys on the top level. I really don't like how it looks because everything else has this very nice prefix keyword for declarations. Uh, I like having the var set it off, even if you could actually support the same syntax as top level scope. So just, I guess, a small note um, that that is uh, a thing. Um, I should also mention, um, for version zero, I actually took out the ability to do declarations in, in local function scope. Um, that's part of what motivated this change as well, because I didn't want to support for v0 having, you know, function definitions, type definitions, all these different things scoped under a function. Um, will be supported eventually, but didn't want to deal with that uh, right now, and it's not all that useful compared to the rest of what we need. Um, and when I did that, I realized that I didn't have a way of doing the equivalent of this now that var was gone. And so that's what prompted me to put it in, but I think it's also just a nicer notation. 
uh, I think this is like Sean Barrett's notation from his old language, which a bunch of, I, I, like, I know John Blow's Jai uses something similar, um, but I don't support it at top level. And, you know, I, I tried it. And I, I don't really like how it feels because everything else, it, it, it sticks out. I don't like how it looks unadorned there. So personal uh, choice, but uh, for now, at least, that's what I'm doing for that. Um, okay, getting to the end. Holy crap. How long have we been going? I'm just covering stuff, but I think this is important. I want it to be on record for the stream, so hopefully this is not boring people to tears. I've been going for an hour, and I'm just reviewing stuff. So yeah, this is it. Uh, yeah, right, and you can do, uh, for, in, for incomplete array sizes, you can do si uh, size inference. So I think we were just looking at a case like that. Um, like this thing here. So this declares A as incomplete type. If you don't have this, it's going to complain that this is a length zero array. Um, but because the declared type is occurring in the context of an initializer, it's going to basically do two things. One is that it's going to evaluate the right-hand side as always in the context of the left-hand side type. In this case, the only thing that matters is the element type so that it knows that one, two, and three are actually ints. Uh, but you could have written, you know, you could have written something like this explicitly, but this is just a shorthand. Um, but then, so it evaluates this, and then when it gets the type, it verifies, of course, that the types are the same, like they're both array types. But if the left-hand side type um, that it's initializing has incomplete type, basically uh, it grabs the, or it's an incomplete size, it grabs the size from the right-hand size, from the right-hand side. Um, I mean, this is how C works as well. So I'm just explaining this stuff in the context of init statements, but that's the logic here. Um, and that's why if you do this, you get a zero size error. Um, some other stuff to go along with this. Yeah, some errors like if you if you try to do stuff like this, um, you know, you can't do this. It's going to say that's void. You're not allowed to have void there. Um, you can't do this which used to be allowed, like all of these things were just sort of errors that weren't being handled. Um, interestingly, maybe you, you, I mean, this is how C works as well, right? You can do, if you do this, then um, even though the declared type seemingly is in three, uh, when it's, and this is how C works as well, um, resolve func body, um, when you're actually descent, when you're actually analyzing the body, it actually does pointer decay on these array types. So in the context of the body, this thing is actually not an, an int array, but it's actually a pointer to an int, and that's how C works as well, from what I can tell. I couldn't find any cases where this implementation doesn't give the right result. Um, and this can also be used with incomplete arrays because again, we never actually, the, the function body never actually sees the incomplete array type. It only sees the pointer type, right? Because there's pointer decay as soon as you enter the scope. So this works, this works fine. Um, you can do, you know, something like this. Let me show you. Um, um, if I have an array, Okay, Visual Studio's indentation is not quite, <laughs> it, it's treating it as a C file, which is almost, but not quite, except uh, what would you want? So suppose we have something like this, uh, and now I call F10 with A. If I do this again, I should see a different, let's do the that element, uh, index zero. Um, Okay, that may actually not work. So it's not doing pointer decay properly here. I wonder why not. Um, why is that not pointer decaying? Okay, that's not working either. So that's just something weird. Let's go and fix that. 
So it works in this case. It's probably because, yeah, let me think. It's because the pointer decay thing is not really, it's trying to, yeah, 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 I think I see. So when you're doing, I see, I see. Um, I think you basically want to do um well, let's do pointer decay on the on this type. So um All right, that doesn't work, I see. It's because of the way we're doing compound literals because our compound literals in this context have a ray type. And then we're trying to, um, we're trying to decay that away prematurely. Um, let me, tr I, I don't think this is the right thing, but I could do something like this. Um, which is probably, well, let me just try it. Um, Okay, so that works with the existing code. Um, if I now do this, okay, that works. Um, and I mean, I should even be able to do stuff like this. Okay. That may have introduced other issues, but um, anyway. This looks reasonable. So it, so it tries all these different things, and if that still doesn't work, and the destination type is an array type, then it tries to do this um, conversion here. Hmm. This probably has an edge case I haven't thought about, but anyway, let's just leave it as that for now. Um, let's see how this code works. So A has values one, two, three. We print. And we, now that value is 42 and there gets printed out. All right. Um, let's remove the prints so that this doesn't gunk up the screen. All right. Um, I think we're at the end of everything I wanted to review and we found a few bugs along the way. I have to think about this case for the conversion. I have to look at the standard and see what it says. I think through it more. Um, I think the problem with this, I mean, actually I can think of a case that where that doesn't work. Like for example, if I have, um, if I have something like this uh, or even three and I just have like a pointer like I think that's a, that would be allowed, which is not. Yeah, that's uh, not legal. So that's allowed by this code. <clears throat> it's kind of the difference between an initializer um, and other cases. It feels like this convertibility stuff with the with this should be done 
oh, maybe this is the kind of thing that should be done in an R value context now that I think about it. So um, like for example, when we're calling a function um, for these arguments, we're doing this conversion and maybe what we need to do is uh, the param type. Yeah, so actually this, this is the right place to do it. Um, if this is that, we need to decay it at this point. I think that's the right approach. Because now this is disallowed, but I think the other stuff is still allowed. Yep. All right. That was the right fix. <clears throat> um, boom, boom, boom. I think we're now at the end of the very long list of things I did yesterday. Um, and as you can see, I think this was a bit of a whirlwind tour, but I think you can see that it's getting pretty... Uh, pretty complete like just in terms of the weird the weird c stuff that it supports um one big thing that i need to do is enums like i said but i know how to do it uh just didn't do it um but the rest of it is sort of pretty much there like we don't do volatile qualification but we don't need it we'll add it eventually and it will work like constant very much pretty much um but yeah let me go and look at the chat i was kind of just rambling on my own but um, i bet there must be some questions and observations from wise people uh, <clears throat> let's see here Someone was asking earlier, and I assume this is when I was talking about literals, since there are compile time constants, couldn't you just compute the value of the constant in the compiler and just inline that? Yes, you could, but the problem with doing that is the C code is not going to be idiomatic, um, which is a very strong goal. So we're not there yet, right? Like I said, we have all this um, over parenthesized junk, which is not that hard to remove, but uh, it's easier to wait until the rest of it is stable before we do that. Um, but the goal is to have idiomatic C code so that we can actually generate C libraries that other C programmers would want to look at. So for us, most of the time, we'll be using things like pound line and, and stuff to look at things through the lens of ion so we can step things at the ion level and, and so on. But I explicitly want to be able to write first class, high quality C libraries that I can distribute you know, as C code, like uh, for example, SDB style single header libraries. And in order to do that, you really don't want to inline the constants, right? Like if you have something called max foo, and that's the size of an array, you don't want the value of max foo to get inlined everywhere it occurs. It's essentially, you know, magic numbers everywhere, except even worse than what a, any human programmer could uh, could do, because it's literally going to almost like macro expand every single constant anywhere in the program. Um, so that's the motivation. I really want to not not do stuff that prevents us from doing idiomatic C code. Uh, of course, right now it isn't fully idiomatic, but the point is there are various choices like pre-evaluating constants. Uh, we, we, by the way, we do have to pre-evaluate the constants, right, for type checking, but we don't emit them. We emit something that's based on the original AST. So that's the motivation for why we can't do that. Um, oh, yeah, someone already mentioned that it's supposed to generate idiomatic C code, so I was just repeating myself. Um, going back to some of the control flow analysis earlier, for goto, don't you just have to verify that there was at least one return statement after the very final goto label on the function? Sure. Like, it depends on how conservative you want to be, right? Like, it would be very easy to have something pretty conservative. And I think for most goto heavy code, uh, that would probably be fine. But you're right. Like, if if after every uh, goto, you sort of verify that there's always a return somewhere, uh, I think that should be sufficient. Someone's asking about C99 restrict keyword. No, we're definitely not going to support that. Um, I don't see the point, to be honest. Like, I understand it gives you optimization capabilities, but I've never used it myself, and I don't particularly want to use it, and it's more complexity. Um, actually, the specification for restrict is surprisingly non-trivial, given, well, 
I guess they have to. I, I think it mostly matters to um, to the back end people in terms of what they're allowed to do. But the uh, where is it? Where's restrict? The restrict blah blah blah. All right. But anyway, yeah, restrict is pretty complicated. Definitely not something I'm interested in doing. Um, Boom, boom, boom. Let's see here. Someone's saying, doesn't restrict just make sure two pointer parameters aren't the same? Yeah, but you have to consider things like if you take a single pointer parameter and you step it now you're like because different arrays you can point to the middle of arrays and stuff like that it's not quite as simple as just saying two things can't point to the same thing because i can take one pointer that points to the beginning of array then i can step it and so anyway i, I think there's some complexity around sub objects and interior pointers and stuff for the specific uh, details. But um, to be honest, I don't quite, like I looked at what was in the standard here and uh, I just noped out basically. So let's see if I can find the section. I could have sworn there was a top level section about restrict. Um, it must be around here, right? Oh, here, formal definition of restrict. Okay, I guess the specification is not as complicated. I thought it was more complicated. Maybe I was reading a, a separate document, not the standard stuff of this. Anyway. All right. Um, All right, just had to block someone on Twitter who made a stupid comment about something unrelated. Um, anytime some, someone I've never seen before shows up in my Twitter timeline with a stupid comment, they always get muted or blocked immediately. I, I recommend that practice as a good way of uh, not going, not getting annoyed at people. All right, uh, inline assembly, no. In, inline assembly, uh, well, inline assembly, not for the host development, but for RISC-V development, definitely. So my plan for inline assembly, like basically inline assembly on the host, if we're using uh, compilation through C, is not really feasible because MSVC doesn't even have inline assembly for 64-bit. And in any case, the MASM syntax is different from you know GCC's GAS style syntax. And GCC inline assembly has the whole clobber, what is it, clobber notation and MSVC doesn't. So uh, not for host development, but the plan is there will be inline assembly for RISC-V. So that code obviously won't be portable. It'll be RISC-V only, and it will only be for our toolchain, not for some random toolchain. Uh, but yeah, that will definitely be there once we get to the RISC-V stuff. You need inline assembly since C has no native CPU ID function. No, you really don't. Uh, you can do everything with, I mean, you can do stuff in C, right? You can expose stuff to C, but I don't know why CPU ID is the one you point out. Like you also can't do RDTSC and a bunch of other things, but um, you can expose you, you can expose things to the language with intrinsics, right? Like you can just expose it however you want, regardless of how it's implemented under the hood. So if you want to have CPU ID or RDTSC, you can just have intrinsics or even just functions that are implemented externally. Uh, but for things that you don't want to make into functions, you can make them intrinsics. All right. Um, okay, so what did it want to do? Um, aside from just bug fixes, which I guess will occur as I encounter bugs, uh, the thing I wanted to do, all right, this is the C code. I guess the, the features I wanted to do was first uh, do stuff for enums. Enums are almost entirely absent. Like they're parsed correctly, but they're not really handled in the resolver and there's not, not any code for them in the code generator. Um, 
but I have a pretty good idea of what I want to do. So I figured let's do that as the first feature today, and maybe we'll do other things after it. But I think that's the the only notable missing C feature right now. So let's do that. Um, and one thing that is a little bit annoying about enums is that um, the specification for the underlying storage type of an enum type is specified in the standard as being at least large enough to contain any of the constants um, or something like that. But it's not, um, what do you call it? Uh, it's not, it, it doesn't have an upper bound. Like for example, I think people know this, but, um, and, and maybe this is a good point to make since people have asked about this in my C code, is sometimes I use this notation in my C code, right? So um, this is a convenient way of doing integer constants in C, uh, which don't have the, the same issues as, um, what do you call it, as pound defined in terms of name collisions not being as catastrophic, right? Um, but one issue with this style of enum is you cannot control the storage type. Um, so, and actually, let me just make it uh, very explicit like this. Um, if I have something like this, uh, well, let me just do it like this. Um, okay, first let's just do one. So, if um, if enums were specified similar to the way literals work, where they have to be like the smallest type that can contain the constants or whatever, something like that, then you would expect this to be maybe a, an, a char or an unsigned char or something like that. Um, but C doesn't really specify that kind of upper bound. It just says it has to be, I'm sorry, wrong startup project. C just says, hey, this thing has to be large enough to accommodate the constants, but it can be arbitrarily much larger, I think. I don't, I don't think there's an upper bound of any sort. Um, and so this is going to be four, which is size event. Um, now, like I said, just to show that it will grow to accommodate stuff, um, let's see what this will do. So let's do eight of those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think this should still be four. It's going to be un essentially unsigned, right? So it's still four. Um, and uh, but now if I add, you know, an extra zero, for example, this should now be eight. Unless I'm totally wrong. Oh, I have to. Um, why does it say truncate? I thought you could do wider stuff. Um, You really can't do this? I thought you could do wider than int constants for enums. Maybe I'm totally wrong about that. Uh, in which case, this is going to be even simpler than expected because we can just have a fixed storage type. Um, all right, let me just actually go and read what they say about it because apparently I am wrong. Um, oh, it's always int. I don't know why I thought they were more generic than that. All right. That's fine with me. Um, oh, so that's just the identifier, right? Because the constants are themselves, right? Oh yeah, that's how it works, sorry. I was confusing myself. The constant themselves just have type int. Um, yep. Let me go and look at the conversions because the conversions is maybe where there's some interesting stuff. No, not here. I guess integer here. Six seven two two. Six seven two two. Here we go. Okay, so each constant should be representable as an int. The identifiers, okay. It's, it should be compatible with char. Um, 
Okay, so let's just make it signed in. Okay, that's easier than I thought. For some reason, I thought the there was more kind of elasticity in the storage type or whatever, representation type. Um, so maybe I will just do it like that. All right. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Um, so first, we already have some stuff about enums, I believe. Let's just remind ourselves. Right. Um, oh yeah, so I, I remember now how we do it. When you declare an enum type, then you basically set up, so I already made some advanced scaffolding for this. So this, this is maybe the only part that's not trivial, so we already did that, that, which is great. For each of the enum items, we create a symbol or a special enum const type of symbol, which you know is associated with the name, but, it, but is linked back to the original enum declaration. And so the idea, the intention is that if you depend on an enum constant, you implicitly depend on the enum type as a whole, not just that specific constant, but all of those. Um, I think one of the complications that we have to deal with, which doesn't fit super well into this general framework, um, but I think can be handled ad hoc, maybe. Can they be handled ad hoc? Yes, they can be. That should be fine. Um, is that... Um, you know, you can do you can do stuff like this, right? Like, um, like you can refer to earlier constants. So we have to handle that, but I don't think that's going to be a big issue. Uh, so we have these in here, uh, and actually, let's put some stuff in our test code, which I think is going to probably crash or do awful things for now. Um, Oh, there's already something called that. Um, there really is already something called flags. Oh, it must be these. OK, that was some sort of a sort. Um, Let's remove some of this junk so we can work on that. Uh, right, right, right. Why is there no call stack? Oh. It took a surprisingly long time. It must be the PDB stuff. Um, I see. So we hit this case because we tried to. So what symbol is this? This is flags. And this was when we're trying to finalize it. Um, I see. So right, right now it assumes. So these asserts are coming in handy. Right now it assumes um, that um, that the only kind of thing that can hit this is an enum, or as a type def rather. So here we have to do something extra. Um, we're gonna do this just to make sure we didn't forget any, about any other case. Um, and so I see, so when we resolve an enum type, I think one of the things we have to do let's see here um, oh right, we have to ultimately resolve a type um. And maybe that's all we really have to do. 
we create an, a, a unique type. I think right now there's nothing that actually creates something of type enum, um, but we do need a unique one for every instance. Maybe we need to link it up to the symbol. Let me think about that. When we're eventually visiting declarations, we need to, yeah, I don't, yeah, no, I don't think we actually need to do that. So let's leave this as it is for now. Okay. I wonder why it's taking so, so, so long to uh, step in after it hits the assert. Anyway, we can go there ourselves. Um, I see, so this is for enum constants. Um, okay, let's see here. So for enum constants, we have to evaluate the right-hand side. Um, so let's just make a version of this. Um, and I think we need... Let me think. When we installed the enum const, what did we associate? Um, no, no, no. I think what we do is when someone tries to depend on the enum constant, we basically want to um, resolve. Let me think here, because when we, is it decal enum const? Right, so when we install this, we associate, we associate this with the enum declaration. Um, and so we want to go and resolve that if someone references the constant. Um, So I think this is what we do. And we only have to do that once. So maybe that's what we do instead of um, Instead of doing it quite like this, well, actually, you could do it like that too. So let's do it like that. Um, you want to do resolve sim. Um, Enum sim it's maybe not the best way to do it, but it requires the minimal amount of changes. And then you want to do
resolve sim enum sim and we copy over its type something like this so if someone depends on an enum constant then we first make sure to go and resolve the enum type definition as a whole having resolved that we then grab its type and make that our type that seems about right um, but you also need to then figure out the right constant so yeah let, let me um, let me put this thing let's stick this into a separate function it's going to get a little bit more complicated So get this, resolve it. Now we have the type. It's a little bit awkward. So does resolving the type entail evaluating all of the associated constants? And if so, it seems like this thing here really needs to um, like there really needs to be Okay. Just like that. Um, and then when you do this, you actually specify a bunch of fields. Um, Right, um, so when you try to resolve the type, um, I think what you actually do 
is um, right. You have all these items. And I use this world field and item. I don't know what the difference is. It's not great naming, but let's not get bogged down into that for now. Um, so let's see when you're. I guess one of the problems is that um, I can go through and I can sort of install the values for all of the constants. But when I'm evaluating the right-hand sides of those constants, I need the other constants to already be installed so you can reference things that are earlier in the list, which doesn't work super great in the context of, um, of most of the way the rest of the symbol table and resolver works. Um, What's the best way to do this? I mean, I could do the cycle detection kind of thing, but that seems pretty needless. Um, maybe what I do, maybe what I do is when you resolve, when you try to resolve the enome type, it fills in an enome type, like installs the copy, but initially, um, no, because that's not going to work in C. If we support the out of order stuff in Ion, this, then C won't support it properly. See if anyone has great ideas, although it's probably not. Let me think here. The fact that those enums are kind of a global scope makes it awkward to deal with. The fact that they are symbols in the global scope makes it really annoying to enforce the linear ordering. Like you could have kind of implied previous constant plus one and stuff like that, but if the resolve order ends up being different than the declaration order for those constants, then you would have to permute them in the generated C code. That seems to me like a bunch of unexpected behavior. I should get lunch. Let me just think about this for a few more minutes. And if I have a great idea, I'll do it. Otherwise, I'll stop the stream and go get lunch. Um, we've already been going for a few hours. How long? Yeah, two hours. So, so maybe let me just think for it for a second more, and maybe I'll come up with a great idea when I'm off to lunch. So, yeah, to, to restate the problem to myself and people listening, the problem is. If enum constants are treated as top-level symbols, then they can be encountered when you're just randomly, when you're resolving an expression, you can reference a name that's bound to that constant. Um, and uh, my, my plan was when you do that externally outside of the enum itself, that essentially just amounts to depending on the enum type as a whole, not the specific constant. But the problem is when you're then evaluating the right-hand side constants that specify the enum constant values, those do need to be able to access not only kind of the global scope of constants, but also the local enum constants. And that that notion of a kind of static scope that's nevertheless kind of global doesn't really uh, fit super well. I wonder if I could exploit my local scope mechanism to do this. So I could do like 
my, my symbol stack, right? Like if I could do something along those lines, maybe that would actually work. So I would basically push one thing, try to evaluate it, push another thing, try to evaluate it. Yeah, that may actually work. Okay, let me try that. So I have some push var. Um, let's do some push const. No, that may not work exactly how I want it to. Um, well, I think this idea can still be salvaged, but it needs some more work. But because the problem is that the symbols still need to exist at global scope, um, not just in the local table. And this feels weird. Um, and I'll get lunch. Seems like a good lunchtime moment. All right, let me just make sure I didn't break anything. unwinding some of this stuff this should crash again yeah um, just remove the enum stuff in the code all right that was a good stopping point unwind the worst of it anyway uh, that was it for this weekend stream um, after some lunch I'll be working on this hopefully get a clean resolution of it no pun intended um, but yeah, so, so we covered a ton of stuff, which I think caught us up with everything I did on the compiler. And so I'm hoping to basically be done with version zero today. I really want to get enums in there, but honestly, even if I have to exclude enums and just rely on normal consts, um, it wouldn't hurt me too much uh, if it gives me time to think of a better approach to doing the enums. But um, so that's it for the stream, and I will see everyone actually tomorrow because this is out of my usual cadence, but I'll be back tomorrow, usual time. So uh, see everyone then. Thanks for coming by.